went through in my own heart and mind several revolutions of thought. First, well, it's funny. I think I, for me, in my own mind, it goes back to the 9-11. I can remember our children were in kindergarten that year, and the Twin Towers fell, and Susan and I, Susan called me, I was at work, and she asked me to come home and get her and go pick up the children from school. And, and on that day and for several days to follow, we watched on TV again and again and again the towers fall. <laughs> and I can remember when that first Gulf War broke out and we could watch on TV, if you will, constantly uh, the, the scud missiles and all this and that. And one of the things I found was that I was spending far too much time watching these things and basically getting myself so worked up and so agitated. And I think as I, our culture is, I don't, don't get me wrong, I like cable TV, but having this stuff fed to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I don't think is healthy for us emotionally. Having people yell at each other on the TV and, or the, you know, if you disagree with me, you must be a fool or an idiot. It's just a difficult world in which we live. And so I, I want to talk to you about Wednesday, but here's what I'm not going to tell you. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not an expert in law enforcement. And I have nothing to add to any of the political things or any of the governmental policies that you can hear people say. Don't listen to me on that stuff because I know nothing. I know absolutely nothing about that. There are people out there who will tell us with great gusto what we should think and what we should do. Listen to them if you so choose. <clears throat> I want to talk about something different. It's how we as Christians respond to evil, like what happened on Wednesday. <laughs> That's going to be the focus of our sermon this morning, and I'm going to do it through the lens of our epistle to Peter. Now, when I first started working on my sermon, I was all set, because I started writing it Wednesday night after the Ash Wednesday service, I was all set to do a wonderful sermon about hell and damnation. That was how I was going to respond. I saw all these comments written by friends and acquaintances on Facebook and on Twitter, and I thought half of them were idiots, and I thought the other half were absolutely right. But I'm too polite to write, you're an idiot. So I was going to be passive-aggressive, and I was going to give a sermon about hell instead. And we all know who's going to be in hell. Those who don't agree with me. <laughs> Then I started studying the scriptures and I began to understand that that emotional reaction that I had was not a Christian one. Don't get me wrong, hell is real and that's a topic of another sermon on another night. But what I came to as I put myself and immersed myself in the Bible for today was an understanding of what Christ has taught us. And that is that we are to love we are to repay evil with good. Oh man, I don't want to do that, do you? If somebody kicks me, I'm all set to kick him back. You know, if I turn my other cheek and he slaps me, and I'm ready to slap him back, we can play that game back and forth. But what does Christ tell us? How are we as Christians to live? And as I was reading uh, first Peter, I began to get an idea of what I really felt called to preach about this morning. Now the problem with the lectionary, it, usually it's right on target, it's right on point, but it's the focus. It's either so tightly focused in that there's like one or two lines that you can make a whole sermon out of, or you read it and it doesn't make much sense because there's something here, yeah I get that, don't understand that, yeah I get that, and then you're done. And I'm thinking, well, what was that all about? You know, it's like being at a Chinese restaurant. You don't quite know what's on your plate when they bring it to you. <laughs> I recognize that, but I don't recognize that. Is that chicken or pork? And I don't want to know if it's a cat or not. <laughs> but this
this reading from Peter is like that. So you need, if you will, pull the focus back. And so I want to tell you a bit about <coughs> who Peter was writing and what the previous parts of this letter, this epistle, are about. Peter was writing, the Apostle Peter, to the new Christians who are living, we assume, in, what, in Rome. And they were living in a time before the year 60, because tradition tells us Peter was killed in the, in the uh, pogrom, the oppression of Christians unleashed by Nero after Rome burned, and Rome burned in the year 60. So this is sometimes before 60, so between 33, when Jesus was crucified, and 60, so probably in the late <coughs> 50s. And the Christians in Rome were Many of them were former Jews, many of them were pagans who converted to Christianity, but they were all united by the fact that they were outsiders. They were not part of the in crowd. To be a good Roman meant following the emperor, and when you followed the emperor, what did that mean? You worshiped the divine Tiberius, the divine Caesar. The power of Rome was based on God's will. Jupiter willed that Rome expand all across the world. And if you didn't believe that, you were a rubble, you are a traitor, and you better keep your mouth shut. So the new Christians in that time lived on the edge, not just of social scorn, of like, ah, you're not going to come out with us to the brothel after work, oh, you must be a pansy or something, oh, I'm a Christian, oh, that's even worse. It wasn't that sort of scorn, it was, you are worshiping a man who was put to death by the state for being a rebel and a traitor. Do you really want to go around making that noise? It's not going to do any good for your career. And in fact, you could get arrested if you're too noisy about this. And Peter is writing to these Christians, living in the time of persecution, living in a time of being in a world, in a society that was totally against what they stood for. And he's saying again and again, and again, emulate Christ. What did Jesus teach us? Turn the other cheek. What did Jesus tell us? Be salt and light into the world. Christianity, for all intents and purposes, was illegal until about the third century, when the Emperor Constantine made it his state religion. And all of a sudden, this minority faith became the official state religion. Have you ever wondered how Christianity survived 300 years of oppression? Most people think that there are only two options. Option A is to accommodate, which means if our faith is going against the culture, well, we can sort of close that chapter of the Bible and not, you know, follow it. Or we can close our eyes to it, or we can rethink our faith to accommodate the culture. Now, after, if you follow that route after 300 years, you're not going to have faith left, are you? You're going to have a culture left. I, uh, so I have a very good friend who's a rabbi, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Uh, I know this sounds like the start of a bad joke, but it's not. <laughs> and one of the things he tells me is that he's quite happy about the future of Judaism in the United States. And I said, well, you know, I keep reading that Jews are disappearing and that they're going to marry and, you know, that Jews are going to be basically gone in a generation or two. He said, yes, but we Orthodox are having six or eight and ten children. <laughs> so the only Jews are going to be around in the year 2050 are Jews like me with side locks. He actually lives in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, New York. In other words, there are two ways you can accommodate the world and be like the Jews that, if you grew up in suburbia, knew in high school or in work, and that culture is disappearing as it sort of merges into the wider American culture, or you can be like an Orthodox Jew, build a little silo, stay in a little enclave, be like the Amish. Don't associate with anybody else outside of your world. Well, the early Christians didn't do either. They didn't accommodate the world. They didn't change their teaching. The Romans, 
thought, these Tacitus writes, these Christians are weird. They eat, they're cannibals. They drink blood and eat bodies. Because they had somebody go to a service and this is my body, this is my blood. You know, the police report is filed. And the Romans say, these people are loons. And if you want to be socially acceptable, you don't talk about eating bodies and drinking blood. They didn't accommodate. Nor did they turn up in the little segregated neighborhoods, not mixing, not doing business with anybody else besides themselves, not having anything to do with anybody else. They were out in the world as salt and light. And what they did was remain faithful, and when the world was unkind, they responded by doing what Jesus did, loving the, the Everybody, not return, returning evil <clears throat> if they received evil. Being a blessing to people, not just other Christians, but to everybody. Now let's look at particular what Peter's writing today. Now I have to say this passage has caused a lot of ink to be spilled because some of its details are still fought over. And well, let's go through this, because this is one of these China, what I would call Chinese restaurant passages, and that it's a lot there, some of it's good, some of it you don't know what it is. So what's the whole point of it? Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. That makes perfect sense. Jesus came not for the great people, but to bring everybody. His death on the cross was not just for us wonderful human beings who know him, but he died for people who despised him. That's perfectly in line. I can make a whole sermon out of that and stop right there. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. Ooh, we're getting a little weird here, aren't we? <laughs> Who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark. That's what you call a non sequitur. How are we getting? All of a sudden, we're in Noah in the ark territory. The spirits in prison, now we're at Noah in the ark. Where is this headed? That is in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which thus prefigured, now saves you. Now, this sounds like a really heavy-handed, Noah's flood was a way of baptizing people. Yeah, that's, uh, that doesn't preach well, does it? And, well, I can say eight people, that's what God started with, Noah, Mrs. Noah, Noah's three sons, and the, his three daughters-in-law. Okay, start with eight people, populate the world. We can make work with that too. But what is this preaching? That, what, you know, what, where's he going with all this? Well, we don't use it in this service. We use the Nicene Creed service in this service, but we use the Apostles' Creed in other services. And one of the things we recite is, He descended to the dead. When, ha what happened after Jesus was crucified on Friday? Where was he on Saturday? Before he was resurrected on Easter Sunday. He descended to the dead. What did he do when he was dead? What did Jesus do when he was in hell? That's a punchline of one of my dumb jokes that I like to tell every so often. But what did Jesus do when he was in hell? He preached to the spirits in prison. Now here's where some of the arguments come. St. Augustine said, the spirits in prison, they are all the sinners in purgatory who don't know Christ. So when Christ went down to the dead, he preached and converted those people in purgatory so that they could be in paradise. <clears throat> John Calvin, being a good Protestant, said, no, 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 no. No purgatory. Jesus went down into hell and preached to the spirits. And if you notice, John Calvin, being a Bible scholar, sp 
Spirits are never, people are never spirits. We have souls. We have human spirits, but when the word spirit, pneuma, appears all by itself, that refers to either God or an angel or a fallen angel. So who did Jesus preach to according to Calvin? The demons in hell. And he preached to the demons in hell before he was resurrected, before he was raised. Now what? Now this is getting weird, isn't it? It's like one of these TV shows that, you know, with angels and aliens and things like that. What's going on here? Well, what I understand and where I've been led in my prayers, I'm not an original thinker, I've read this, is that what Peter is saying is that when Christ died, even when he was in hell, he continued to love those around him. Now, we can argue who those around him were. Demons, those in purgatory, those in hell. It doesn't matter to me. What Peter is saying is you're to emulate Christ in what you do. So that when you live in this broken, fallen life, when you live in hell when it is now, when you live in a world where kids are shot, can't go to school without the fear of death. You are to continue to live as Christ lived. And Christ taught us to love and to return evil, to return good for evil. So what does this got to do with Wednesday? <coughs> what does this got to do with the shooting in Orlando? Car bombs in the Middle East, airliners crashing into buildings, pain and suffering and loss. Our response as Christians is to love our enemies. That's not the political response. That's not the policy response. This church, denomination, we do not tell you how to vote or think politically. That is your choice. You, as the laymen and women of this church, need to ground your heart and your thoughts in Scripture and then go out and make change into this world. But the church is not going to tell you which direction. It's the church is not going to tell you who to vote for. The church shouldn't take a position on gun control and and mental illnesses and things like that that are political issues when there are people of goodwill on either side. What the church should do is teach you what as a Christian you should do, which is lead with love. And then go out in the world and make the changes that you are called to do. Last fall, I was asked by a parishioner to go with them to an anti-death penalty rally because they wanted to protest the death penalty in Florida. I actually am in favor of the death penalty. But I went. I didn't wear my collar. I went, not because I'm against the death penalty or for the death penalty, that's my private, personal view. But I went because I was there because one of the people of our church felt called by their faith to take a stand on an issue, and I was there to stand in solidarity with them. Not with the issue. You understand the distinction? I had to take my own personal viewpoints of these people are nuts <laughs> off the table and to love every single one of them because that is the call God made upon my life. Not to be loved by people, but to love people. What we as Christians are called to do in circumstances of evil is to love and to use our brains and our intellect in a rational, civil discourse to find the way forward. Whatever that may be, I don't know. Don't ask me. I don't know anything about these topics. That doesn't stop most people from talking about things when they don't know anything. But what I do know is what Christ calls us to do. Love. What, and Peter closes out this letter, that this particular passage, by saying, look, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter 
your status among your neighbors, whether or not you're favored or despised by the emperor, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether the things of this world are for you or against you, because what really counts at the end of the day, and what he says counts at the end of the day, is that Jesus is at the right hand of God with the angels, the authorities, and the powers made subject to him. Don't put your trust, your faith in men or governments or fashions or ideologies. All of that stuff is down here. What's behind it is the power of Jesus Christ. Start with Jesus. Don't, don't push him to one side. Make him the center of everything. Amen. Amen. Friends, would you please stand and join with me in saying...